Um, hi everyone, so my name is Luna. I will be your chair for this evening. Um, first of all, before we start off with anything, I would like to do a land acknowledgement. Um, so I would like to acknowledge this sacred land on which we are residing. It has been a site of human activity for 15,000 years. This land is the territory of the Huron, Wendat, and Paton First Nations, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. The territory was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, I apologize for any mispronunciations, um, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and Confederacy of the Ojibwe and Allied Nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. So today, the meeting place of Toronto is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community on this territory. So also welcome everyone, uh, bienvenue. Um, also, so to get started, I'm just going to introduce our speakers for this evening. Um, so first off will be Barry. Barry, how do you pronounce your last name? I'm sorry. Wise letter. Wise letter. Yeah. So this is our, um, our first speaker. So he's a founding organizer of the Substitute Teachers Union. He's also the chair of the NDP Socialist Caucus. Guilty. Yeah, guilty, guilty as charged. The co-editor of Socialist Action Monthly, and he's been to almost every federal NDP convention since 1970. So that's incredibly, incredibly impressive. Um, Jason Baines here to my right is a former Ontario NDP uh, youth co-chair. Um, he's also an NDP organizer and campaign manager. He's a longtime socialist, protest organizer, and founding member of NDP Momentum. Um, so how we're going to, how the evening will go this evening is Barry will speak for 10 minutes. If he goes over, I'm going to stop him because, <laughs> or else he will continue um, and we Sorry. don't want that. I thought we said 15, although I think 10 Did we say 15? 15, oh let's give 15. you 15, come on, yeah. Well, we'll see. Okay. <laughs> and, then, uh, and, and then Jason will speak as well and then we will open the floor uh, to comments and questions from everyone here. Um, uh, after that. It's pretty much open for discussion, so we'll begin with Barry. Thank does you anybody, very much. Before we start, though, does anybody have any questions, comments, concerns? Everyone's great. All right, so welcome to Barry. Okay. Let's get started. Thank you all. Welcome. How are you all doing? Um, today, uh, a wide political gulf separates uh, social democracy and Marxism, and that's the topic that we're going to address, social democracy and Marxism in the era of, uh, of, of uh, Corbyn and Sanders. Uh, and and there, there's a big difference between these, these two uh, political tendencies. But in 1868, that's 148 years ago, they were one and the same. They were one and the same organization and political tendency. So how did political programs with a common root differentiate to such a great degree over time. And what does the relationship of social democracy and Marxism mean for politics today? Well, during the late 19th and early 20th century, social democracy was a movement to replace private ownership with social ownership of the means of production, distribution, and exchange. That was the common line of social democracy. It was basically for the revolutionary overthrow of all existing conditions, as explained by, by Marx. And, and the movement was influenced, um, in, the, in the case of Germany, for example, which is important, I'll explain in a moment why. Um, it was influenced by Karl Marx, who headed up um, uh, an organization um, linked to um, the, um, the Communist League or the first International or the International Working Men's Association, and a fellow by the name of Ferdinand LaSalle, who headed up another radical uh, German left wing uh, organization. And these were among the first working class organizations. Now, when the first Social Democratic Party in Europe, the Social Democratic Workers' Party of Germany, was established, scientific socialism, or Marxism, if you will, uh, was its official basis in theory and program and in practice. Uh, it was embraced by the entire movement. 35 years later, a new tendency arose. And giving it expression was a German politician by the name of Edward Bernstein. 
And Edward Bernstein rejected the revolutionary and materialist foundations of Marxism. Bernstein argued that socialism should be grounded in ethical and moral arguments. And how was it to be achieved? It was to be achieved through gradual legislative reform. So a split occurred between reformism and revolutionary socialism. But this split was not the result of some abstract philosophical disagreement. I mean, there were philosophical disagreements, but that wasn't really at the heart of the differentiation that occurred. The, the, it was a difference over the class nature of the state. It was a difference that occurred over the problem of bureaucracy in the workers in the working class organizations, and it was a differentiation that occurred over bourgeois ideology. And by bourgeois ideology, I'm referring to many things, but particularly in, in terms of the political arena, I'm referring to nationalism in the oppressor imperialist countries. Uh, the idea that that nationalism was a was a, a good just was a justification for war, for example. Now, great debate occurred between these currents and their chief uh, protagonists. Um, Rosa Luxemburg, a brilliant Polish Marxist, explained the rise of reformism, and she explained it this way. She said it was due to the power of a layer of full-time labor and social democratic officials. Officials who saw their career prospects linked to the stability of parliament, to the stability of the bourgeois state, and to the growing apparatus, all of the employed people and all of the associated uh, instruments of the uh, worker, working class movement. So privileged socialist politicians and their appointees did not want to rock the boat. Their references to socialism increasingly became limited to speeches that were given at Sunday picnics. Bernstein put it uh, most succinctly when he wrote, uh, the movement is everything and the goal is nothing. The movement is everything and the goal is nothing. In this sense, careerism and routine supplanted revolutionary action and strategy. That was a big divide between the revolutionary and the reformist wing of the movement with the rise of the apparatus and the adaptation to the state by those who found it, frankly, more comfortable to work in an office and to administer money coming in from workers who are paying their dues to the party rather than being on the assembly line or digging coal in a mine or, or, um, or, or, or trucking heavy goods on the roads from one place to another. Now, Marx and his chief political collaborator, Frederick Engels, uh, founded the first international, and it had a sexist name, the International Working Men's Association, um, and that was founded in 1863. Over the next 26 years, revolutionary socialists uh, differentiated from another current, anarchism. Now, both the Marxists and the anarchists rejected the bourgeois state. They were against the state as it was, uh, serving the rich minority. But the anarchists rejected workers' intervention into the existing political arena. And anarchists opposed the formation of a worker state to defend working class conquest of power, wherever it did occur or wherever it might occur. They were against uh, a centralized state. They wanted associated cooperatives and, and communes. Marxists, on the other hand, argued that no working class insurrection could be sustained without, a, without centralized organs of workers' political and, and military power. Nor could um, workers' rule be sustained without a democratically planned economy. If you, want to, if you want the trains to run on time and to feed the cities and to do all of the things necessary for society to um, serve the majority and improve their conditions of life, you need to organize it. And that is a planned economy and it means a, an apparatus, but it has to be a democratic one. So this Marxist argument about the need for uh, party and state, worker state, not a bourgeois state, was essentially verified throughout history. And we, I'll just give two examples. The Paris Commune in 1871, where work, this was the first workers' government in the history of the world. Uh, but it lasted only two months. 
because the reactionary forces of Versailles, with the Prussian troops uh, standing ready to join the attack, drowned the communards in, 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 in a sea of blood. Uh, and uh, that was the end of the first workers' government. And Marx drew, not him alone, drew conclusions from this. The workers need to establish their power on a big territory, and they need to have the means to defend themselves. Uh, ergo, the need for it, a state and a revolutionary party. It was also verified in a more positive way, uh, at least at first, by the Russian Revolution of 1917. Now, the gains of the Russian Revolution, however distorted, uh, because of uh, uh, imperialist uh, intervention, wars, embargoes, and, and privation. Those gains of the Russian Revolution lasted 72 years, and they helped working class people bring concessions from capital in the West and beyond. So the Russian Revolution had a much greater staying power than the Paris Commune. Uh, it's not for this speech to analyze what happened to the Russian Revolution, but we can get into that discussion if anyone's interested. So, these political currents, Marxism and Reformism and Anarchism, the three main currents of the workers' movement, arose in the working class. They arose from the strivings of workers to throw off oppression of all kinds and to create a better world. So the lesson for us today is twofold, I think. I think the lesson is twofold. One, political differences in the working class are inevitable especially given the influence of alien class ideologies. And two, open democratic debate by the rank and file, by the mass membership of workers' parties, like the NDP, is the best way to decide policy and action, not the dictates of privileged bureaucratic authoritarian leaders who tell us how to think, who tell us what the slogans shall be, who ignore policies adopted at party conventions or union conventions, and who remove candidates because they're not singing from the official hymn book that comes from on high rather than from the bottom up. Unfortunately, that's not how the right-wing labor and social democratic leaders see it, that, it, that uh, it, debate, open debate should be the way to decide on policy and action rather than by authoritarian leaders. Uh, the, the social democratic leaders feel threatened by democratic debate, so they tend to limit debate and to exclude their radical critics in one way or another. The evolution of right-wing social democracy away from scientific socialism, or Marxism, had dire consequences. The right-wing abandoned class struggle in favor of class collaboration. Now that's a mouthful. They abandoned class struggle in favor of class collaboration. So, so what? Well, in times of capitalist expansion, when the system is producing more goods and services and things are looking brighter, um, uh, the, the tendency towards class collaboration simply means that the political independence and the organizational strength of the workers' movement is sapped, is reduced. But in times of capitalist crisis, it's not just the sapping of the strength of the workers' movement and its independence. We see an intensification of exploitation and misery. And that's what we're experiencing in this phase of capitalism in the wake of the, uh, the world of the Great Recession. Moreover, when the capitalist rulers need a distraction, when they need a scapegoat for the failure of their dog-eat-dog -dog private profit system, they incorporate the realistic reformists into their wars of imperialist carnage and con conquest. And that is what happened in the lead up to World War I. With a few honorable exceptions, the social democratic parties of the Second International, the Socialist International, so-called, capitulated to the war to end all wars. That was World War I. Um, now, fast forward to the British Labour Party Prime Minister Tony Blair. Blair fully supported and joined Washington's war against Iraq and Afghanistan, and his successors on both sides of the parliamentary aisle followed into Libya and Syria and Ukraine. So you see the continuity of uh, the, 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 the detrimental role of nationalism in the oppressor countries, the, the, the consequences of the realistic policy of the reform leaders as they adapt to the les uh, raisons the, d'etat, the, the goals of the bourgeois state in advancing its agenda. Now, to make a long story short, I'm sure the chair will be relieved to hear me say that, 
Social democratic reformism evolved into social liberalism, especially after, after the eclipse of the post-war, post-World War II welfare state in Europe and North America. Today, labor-based social democratic parties merely, uh, or uh, not merely, rarely, rarely even refer to socialism. Instead, they argue for balanced capitalist budgets without any major increase in taxes on corporations and the rich. And of course, that means capitalist austerity. It is exactly what conservatives say, and it is what liberals say behind a smile. In the Canadian election of October 2015, we saw this dismal course unfold, personified in the NDP leadership of Thomas Mulcair. But something quite interesting occurred in the aftermath. NDP grassroots members demanded a leadership review. Uh, the Socialist Caucus and Momentum helped to shape and amplify the revolt of the ranks. Uh, we didn't conjure it up, but we did further it. Um, and at the federal NDP convention in Edmonton, Alberta last April, delegates voted 52% to demand that Mulcair um, uh, exit from his position. And, and at that same convention, delegates voted over 60% to endorse for discussion the radical eco-socialist lead manifesto, copies of which are available tonight at the table near the door. Canada is not alone in witnessing this massive mood for change. It has catapulted lifelong anti-war activist and socialist Jeremy Corbyn into the leadership of the British Labour Party. It attracted millions of voters to the self-proclaimed socialist banner of Bernie Sanders in the Democratic Party primaries. It has generated general strikes from Greece to France. Uh, we were talking before the meeting about uh, La Nuit Debout. Uh, and there's going to be another wave of uh, demonstrations against the horrible labor law in that country uh, in the days ahead. And it has uh, eroded the boundaries of the austerity para state known as the European Union. You've all heard of Brexit and the reasons for it, I think, can be uh, uh, understood in this context. So this brings us, in conclusion, this brings us back to the relationship between social democracy and Marxism. These two major historical currents of the workers' movement are rooted in the worldwide working class, and they continue to contend for the hearts and minds of working people and the oppressed. The good news is that the radicals and revolutionaries are making a comeback. We are rising and we are determined to win, which is especially good news in a world threatened by eco-catastrophe. So I'll leave you with that. I pass the baton to my uh, comrade Jason. Yeah. It's always, uh, it's always intimidating speaking after Barry, um, but uh, I'm going to give it a shot anyway. And I just like to say that I think there are, are kind of in a modern context in the 20th century, uh, really three uh, primary strands of social democracy. And the first and early inception was, as Barry mentioned, of, was uh, social democracy as a revolutionary current that uh, flowed organically from the workers' struggle. Uh, and then there was the post-war uh, social democracy, which was uh, responsible for a mass expansion of the welfare state, uh, improvements uh, in the uh, conditions of ordinary workers. And then the post-1989-91 uh, uh, period of social democracy, the last quarter of the century, which has been marked by neoliberalism, austerity, privatization, uh, and war. Uh, and um, I think that it's fair to say that these are, are, are fundamentally different strands, and that we are now, of course, entering into a new period uh, um, that has been marked by the banking crash uh, and the emergence of Jeremy Corbyn uh, as a radical socialist uh, leader of the, the Labour Party. Um, and I think because of that situation, uh, due to the banking crash in particular, we are now dealing with a situation where there's been the development of kind of a broad anti-corporate consciousness. Some people call it anti-capitalism. Uh, and through that process, we've seen the development of a socialist consciousness, or we'll say even a social democratic consciousness that has re-emerged. Now, the last quarter of a century, uh, Margaret Thatcher ruled in an ideological sense with her position of Tina, there is no alternative. And the social democratic parties adopted this position. And it appeared based on this logic that we were entering into uh, 
uh, an epoch of kind of the end of history, uh, as, uh, as Fujimori uh, uh, once uh, noted. And um, that was obviously shattered by the Iraq War, that was shattered by the banking crash, and it confirmed the very foundations of Marxism uh, to be born correct uh, in the modern times upon which we live. And that saw the emergence of new parties. Uh, Syriza, uh, which unfortunately has taken the traditional social democratic line, but also Podemos, uh, you would say uh, as an example, uh, the AAA in Ireland, uh, and now of course, the, uh, the unthinkable happening, the party of Tony Blair uh, and the party of Gordon Brown uh, being won over by a mass movement of the working class with a socialist leader uh, who is uh, absolutely committed to the cause of the working class. Yeah. And that marks a fundamental line of demarcation between the old social democracy as we know it and the modern social democracy as a radical current now that is emerging. Uh, and the reason why I would say that is that traditional social democratic norms in the past, even in the post-war boom, uh, have, were very much about trying to contain the movement, uh, trying to shut it down, derail it, uh, and give it kind of more of a, of a, of a reformist um, uh, uh, context to it. Uh, very just gradual uh, reforms. In fact, this is the basis of, uh, of reformism as we understand that to be. And Jeremy Corbyn is basing himself completely on the opposite context. He's proceeding from a Marxist perspective, which has Karl Marx always viewed the working class or the movements, social movements, as the driving engine in society and the driving force behind a, uh, behind a mass party of the left. And Jeremy is, uh, is, is approached it this way. He's built, built up a momentum, uh, which is a socialist movement. John McDonald, the People's Chancellor of the Exchequer, the soon-to-be People's Chancellor of the Exchequer, is involved in it. Diane Abbott, uh, the bulk of the leadership uh, is, uh, is uh, very much involved uh, in this uh, process. Uh, and so um, I think that we should now look at the question of whether or not it's possible that uh, there is a blurring now, that social democracy is returning more back to its Marxist roots, and that we can reclaim this as an idea, uh, and uh, especially since uh, we shouldn't let, um, you know, neoliberals steal our, the name of our, of our movement and, our, and of our party. Uh, Trotsky uh, developed what we call uh, a transitional program. And this was to try to bridge the day-to-day -day experiences of ordinary working people and socialism. So that means that you know, we want to change the world, we want to have a fundamentally different society that's based on people's needs, not private property, but at the same point in time, people proceed on a day-to-day -day basis. People have to pay their rent, they've got to go to, they, they're, they're trying to unionize at work, they're getting uh, harassed by the employer work, uh, their social services are being reduced, and so on. Uh, and so he developed a context of kind of radical reforms uh, that would kind of point in the direction of a socialist uh, change to society. Now I would say methodologically speaking, Jeremy Corbyn is approaching things in the same context uh, that, uh, of the transitional program. Um, he is not putting forward the full program that Trotsky advanced of nationalization of the command heights of the economy, but at the same point in time, we're not living in the same period of the post-war boom, when there was the Soviet Union, as Barry mentioned, as a pole of attraction, when there were social democratic parties, and then the debate in that context was socialism versus revolution, or, or you know, incremental socialism uh, through parliament. Uh, we are dealing with 25 years of privatization, austerity, and neoliberalism. And in this context, by Jeremy Corbyn calling to expropriate the railways from Richard Branson, to nationalize uh, energy, uh, to scrap nuclear warheads, mm -hmm. uh, to uh, provide universal child care, abolish tuition fees, um, yeah, develop a mass program of public works, universal child care, not $15 a day, mm -hmm. uh, that this is uh, pointing in the crux of socialist demands that were at the inception of the Marxist movement. Uh, in at least the 20th century, those of us that, that are adherence, uh, adherence to the ideas of Leon Trotsky and Karl Marx, as an example, uh, I would feel that very comfortable uh, with the program that he's advancing. So far so, in fact, that uh, in British history, every single leader of the opposition, every prime, prime minister, has bowed routinely for the Queen. And after being sworn in as leader of the opposition, it took six weeks for Jeremy Corbyn to negotiate with the Queen a meeting because he refused to bow uh, yeah, to yeah. her. Now, this, is, this is an absolute, this is calling for break. This is, this, is, this is initiating to the mass of people that he's prepared to break uh, with mainstream capitalist orthodoxy. And I'd like to 
uh, just suggest on this issue that many labor leaders, uh, when, the, when uh, going to the Queen, remind me very much of my uh, lovely dog Bronstein. Uh, when I come back uh, from the store, which you look at my belly a little bit more often uh, than you might expect, but uh, when I come back from the store, he knows there's going to be some treats there for me. He's sitting down, yeah, salivating at the concept. Of course, these, these leaders are not as far sighted as uh, my dog, and they certainly do not have the good intentions uh, that he does. Uh, <laughs> nevertheless, um, I would suggest on other factors, on other issues as well, I'm very pointed out the First World War. Now, this was a crux in our movement in 1914, when socialists resisted uh, the First uh, World War, the carnage, the uh, nationalist uh, hatred uh, that the world was descending into. The Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn is unequivocally anti-imperialist. They are on the side of uh, establishing, uh, or fighting for the liberation of Palestine. They are opposed to uh, the, uh, um, the imperialist uh, massacre in Syria. And Germany, of course, was head of the Stop the War Coalition, which was the primary social movement that mobilized the four million people in London against the Iraq War uh, in 2003, 2004, when there were big mobilizations against that. Um, so I would like to say, suggest that it is possible that Marxists can coexist within the concept of a radical reformist perspective, what would, would be considered a radical reformist perspective, maybe revolutionary reformism in a sense. And that is, if we would take uh, the example in the 1980s of the uh, Marxist-led city council in Liverpool. Uh, now, the, what was this? These were socialists who were in the Labour Party, they won the leadership of the city council, they were up against the capitalist class, they were up against the press, and they did their best that they could with the conditions that they had. They had to build houses, uh, they uh, expanded childcare units, and they did the best that they could. But fundamentally, these were uh, Marxists working in a mass social democratic party within the context of capitalism. Uh, and so I think that what this is suggesting is, in my opinion, uh, what poses the question, what kind of socialism is this? What kind of socialism is Jeremy Corbyn? Is it radical social democracy? Is it a Marxist social democracy? Or are we entering into a new period where there's a kind of a broader socialism? Where there's, uh, uh, there are workers that identify as being social democrats in a more classical sense, which in my opinion would be satisfactory to collaborate with because the primary issue that we face in the NDP is ending the neoliberal position, the neoliberal hege hegemony in the NDP, moving it in a clear class position of which social democracy would be one historic facet to that, and obviously socialism and Marxism uh, would be another facet as well uh, within that context. And um, I would just like to cite in the end, as we're kind of moving on here, as Barry said, uh, well, before, I'll just, I'll just, well, one quick point, um, and that is that um, Trump wrote a marvelous article on uh, called The Question of Revolu Revolutionary Force. It actually deals with the British Labour Party. Uh, and in this article, he uh, puts forth how a Labour government could come to power, nationalize this, uh, key sectors of the economy, mobilize the working class, and end the rule of House Lords and the monarchy. Uh, now, Jeremy Corbyn is not necessarily in full step with that perspective. In fact, he's not. I've argued how that's contextual. The period is fundamentally different. Trotsky was writing after the Russian Revolution. Corbyn is operating in the period of, uh, of, the, of, of austerity. Um, but uh, methodologically, I think that within that context, he ne it, it, Trotsky never makes the point of the obsession of the Revolutionary Party. Now this is not to say that the Revolutionary Party is not important, or revolutionary tendencies are not important, or organized Marxist currents are not important. But I don't think that we should view this as being necessarily the vehicle upon which the socialist transformation of society will necessarily occur. I believe if we look at Hugo Chavez as an example, uh, it was a, a series of different uh, currents uh, that had influenced the intention uh, that sought to bring out socialism. If we look at, at Cuba as an example, uh, under Castro, we saw, again, uh, a Stalinist influence movement, but, but the movement of the masses and the demands of the masses uh, forced uh, them to carry through socialism, and Cuba would be, in my opinion, uh, a more healthy expression of the working class struggle than what would have existed uh, in the former Soviet Union. Um, and so, yeah, so just to conclude, you know, Barry pointed out correctly that we are, you know, in terms of the NDP, we are now entering into a new stage of development, in my opinion. For the first time in our history, we've removed the leader of the party. Uh, for the Canadian Labour Congress, Ken Giorgetti was the first time in the Canadian Labour Congress's history that a, that a sitting president was removed. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a Frank Gray's poll, uh, had recently uh, uh, concluded that 56% of Canadians 
foresee things deteriorating, and view class conflict as in violent class conflict, actually, is the, the, what he actually says. Violent class conflict as inevitable, or as likely, I think, is what the, uh, what the, what the, uh, what the, uh, is what the poll says. So I would suggest that there is, combined with these processes, we've seen Sanders, we've seen Corbyn, there are ripple effects happening right now. The biggest ripple, or hiccup if you want to call it, we'll say, or burp even, was Tom Mulcair last night, uh, <laughs> declaring himself to be for socialism. Uh, reminds me of, uh, you know, Jerry Falwell or something like this. But nevertheless, we will take, uh, if a million people are on the television last night watching uh, somebody talk about socialism, this is, a, this is a step forward and we should, you know, we should welcome that. And now we have to discuss, what, Tom, what do you mean by socialism? Oh, I'm almost there. Uh, so, um, yeah, so I will just say that within this context, I believe socialist Marxist in momentum, uh, we want you to join with us, Socialist Caucus and Momentum, both of us, we work very collaborative together so that we can help move this process along because we are, have an open field now uh, of uh, uh, a, uh, a leadership contest in the NDP. Uh, Tom talking about socialism yesterday. Uh, there's discussions of uh, people's names have been tossed around. I believe Avi Lewis has rejected it. Uh, there have been prominent you know, uh, left-wing uh, labor officials, um, Nikki Ashton, Sharon Angus, Sid Ryan. All these names have been tossed forward. And uh, you know, I think that we should uh, encourage people on the left to stand and pose to them. Well, are you going to return to public ownership? We need to nationalize the railways. We need to nationalize Petro Canada. Uh, Barry has pointed out several times that we need to talk specifically about public ownership of oil uh, as a means of resolving uh, the contradiction that leads aspirations uh, to end uh, climate exploitation and degeneration and uh, the rule of big oil uh, over uh, uh, over our society. Um, so yeah, I'll just finish with that and say that I believe uh, the future is orange, and when I mean orange, I mean red. <laughs> All right, yay! So thank you so much to both Barry and Jason. Um, so we would like to open up the floor and just to start.